I've often said that I am a credible person telling an incredible story. I cannot convince anyone. All I can do is speak my truth and say what I've found in my research. I fully recognize this stuff is on the outer bounds of what may or may not be real. I, I also say that it would be totally easy to just dismiss it. And as an outsider, someone, not me, could dismiss this. I'm Mike Cleland, and this is the Out and Back Podcast. Hello, everyone. Shanti here. Welcome to episode 39 of the Out and Back Podcast presented by Gaia GPS. If you've slept under the stars, you know how special staring up at a glittering sea of lights can be. Gazing deeper and deeper into the depths of other galaxies is a mythical, transcendent experience. Some might even describe it as magical. Backpacking guide and avid outdoorsman Mike Cleland sleeps outside as often as he can. Cowboy camping one night 15 years ago, something happened that changed Mike's life forever. He tried to dismiss it, but it happened again. And again, that series of events sent Mike down the unlikely path of studying UFO abduction and the role owls play in these highly charged moments. The lines between mundane, mythical, and magical started to fade away like stars in the backdrop of the night sky. Skeptical? We'll see how you feel after Mike tells his tale. Before we get started, like Mike, you can find the perfect place to cowboy camp All you need is the Gaia GPS app on your phone. Download the USFS, MVUM, and Public Lands maps in the app to discover quiet campsites on national forest land easily accessible by car. While we can't promise you'll see a UFO, we can give you special access to 20% off of a Gaia GPS premium membership. Just go to GaiaGPS.com slash podcast. That's G-A-I-A-G-P-S.com slash podcast. Okay, enough from me. Here's Mike. I had nothing to do with the outdoors until I was about getting close to 30 years old. And I had lived in New York City as an artist and an illustrator doing freelance work, mostly for advertising agencies. And I was a full on yuppie in the 1980s. And late in the 1980s, I was a ski bum for one year in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and I could never get back on the other track again. Everything about me was being pulled out west, pulled out west. So I gave it all up everything in the city and and moved out west permanently in the late 1980s. And I worked for an outdoor school and did mountaineering courses in Alaska and in Canada and winter trips all throughout the Rockies and taught rock climbing and wilderness skills. And these courses ran 30 days. And that was sort of the bread and butter of the school, these long, ambitious 30-day trips. And I worked for that school as an instructor for 17 years. And then... During that time, I worked for a handful of guiding services in Alaska, doing big mountain guiding up in in the out of Tokitna. Also, uh, got into ultralight backpacking and have worked with Andrew Skirka over the years and have taught lightweight expeditioning skills. And all of this outdoor work really changed me and my relationship to wilderness and the outdoors. It turned into sort of a need in me to be outdoors and to give myself over completely to the wilderness experience. And I got very good at basically sleeping under the stars. I learned to love the simplicity of the ultralight stuff. And I gave up on the big mountain stuff in Alaska with crampons and ropes. I learned to love the lightweight stuff where I could travel a lot more freely. It was nourishment to my soul. And I keep on going back to the fact that I love to sleep outside. And if I can, I'll just sleep in the backyard. It's a nice night. But there's something about lying on the ground and giving yourself over to sleeping. In 2006, I had been working in Alaska all summer long. And that involved big backpacks full of mountaineering gear. And I wanted nothing more than to just go out and sleep under the stars in the Tetons. At the time, I was living in Driggs, Idaho which is just on the west side of the Tetons. It was the most beautiful place to have as a backyard. Tons of wildlife and and really easy access to get deep into the backcountry. So what I would do is just go in for one night and sleep under the stars. And there was a woman and she worked at the school where I worked and she had been there all summer. Now this was autumn, I had been in Alaska all summer. 
And I said to her, wow, you've been here all summer. You must have camped a lot here. She looked at me and said, no, I haven't camped hardly at all. Not once this whole summer. And I said, oh, well, I'll take you out for one night. So in a weird way, it was sort of a first date. So I said, let's go out. We'll go out for one night. We picked a night where it was guaranteed that it was going to be a calm, clear night, which in the autumn in the in that part of the Northern Rockies is pretty easy to, you know, just looking out the window to the west. And when the sun is setting, you know, there's not going to be a cloud in the sky all night long. So we got to this spot in the mountains. As the sun was setting, we left in the afternoon. And just in a few hours with a light pack, we could get deep into the mountains. And we were in this beautiful spot. It's part of the Death Canyon shelf. I was technically in the National Forest, in the Jedediah Smith wilderness. And the sun was setting, and the moon was rising, and we were in this field of wildflowers. And I was sitting on a rock, and I was making dinner. Now, I had been out a lot that summer. I was completely in my element. And we were talking. And as we were talking, like I recognized there was something really powerful about what this woman was saying. And her name is Kristen. And she was sort of talking about her really deep spiritual beliefs. And I, I was really struck. And I thought like, wow, this is a much deeper, smarter, more insightful person than I realized when I asked her to come camping with me. And at that moment, an owl flew over us. And then a second owl. And then a third owl. And these three owls stayed with us for the next couple of hours as the sun set. We actually cleaned up our kitchen, walked for 20 minutes, and found a nice spot to, to sleep. And the owls followed us. And we laid our sleeping bags down on the ground and lied on our backs and looking up at the beautiful sky, the like the gorgeous high elevation, Rocky Mountain, trillions of stars and the owls would fly right above our faces and owls are eerily silent in flight they have special feathers so that they make what amounts to zero noise when they fly so there was no noise but looking up at the stars they would fly very close to our faces and the sky would be blotted out for just a half a second it was positively magical After that trip, which was great, I said, let's let's go camping again. So four days later, I called her up and said, let's go again. And she said, yes. And we went to a totally different part of the mountains. And it was a little colder. So at sunset, I said, let's climb that hill up over there. Let's just walk to the top of that hill. And in the five minutes it will take to walk to the top of the hill, we can warm up a little bit. And then when we come back down, we'll be a little warmer when it comes time to climb into the tent. And she said, great. So we got to the top of the hill just as the sun was setting with a magnificent view of the Tetons. And an owl flew right next to us and landed on a branch very close to us. And then another one flew above us. And then one landed at our feet. Now, when it happened four days earlier, these three owls were off in the distance. They were there. They would swoop close to us and they would be in trees fairly close. Not this time. They were close enough to touch on the branches next to us. They landed at our feet. And to have it happen once it was pretty cool. To have it happen twice with the same person four days later was positively mind-blowing. And and I am convinced, there's no way I can prove this, obviously, but I am convinced it was the same three owls. We were miles away from where we had been that first time. Now, this is something I did not talk about when I first had this experience. I, I hid this. When I saw those owls on both nights, I heard a voice in my head that clearly said, this has something to do with the UFOs. So after that point, both Kristen and I kind of, like I know I did, and she did to a certain degree too, went a little nutty as far as like trying to search out the totem meaning of owls and try to search out the, the deeper meaning of owls. But I went in and really made it a sort of mission to try to unravel the mystery that had been presented to me. I saw an owl and heard a voice in my head that said it was connected to UFOs. Now... That happened in 2006. In the spring of 2009, I started a blog. 
And initially my blog was about synchronicities, like powerful coincidences, which I've had a lot of. And I started putting these online. And one of the things that I put online within the first day, I think it was the second day of the blog, I, I told the story I just told about Kristen in the mountains and seeing the owls. But after I posted that, there was one thing that was really bugging me. And, and what were we talking about that first night when we saw the first set of owls? I remember it was something spiritual. I remember it was something that really got my attention. She had moved shortly after we went camping together, and I hadn't seen her for years. So I called her up, and she answered the phone, and I said, what were we talking about the very first night when we saw the first set of owls? And without skipping a beat, she said, oh, I remember exactly what we were talking about. I was trying to articulate my deepest feelings about God. And now I had already been lost and obsessed about owls and UFOs. When she told me this, it took an already powerful set of events and it became sort of transcendent to me. Now, like I'm not at all churchy and I'm not invested in like what God may or may not mean, but I recognized the spiritual and life-affirming power of what she had said about when we first saw those owls. Now, I had said that I heard a voice in my head that said, this has something to do with the UFOs. I reviewed my initial notes right after that. I did a diary entry about seeing those owls. And here's what I wrote. I saw the owls. I heard a voice in my head that said, this has something to do with the UFOs. You are an abductee. So it was a little more heavy handed than that. And I'm, and I'm, just out of sheer politeness, I'm shy to play up the drama like that. But that is what my original notes said. And I don't remember that, but I, it was certainly my handwriting when I wrote it up. To feel that and to hear it in my head, it changed the direction of my life. From that point on, my life trajectory was following one track after those owls in the mountains with Kristen, that trek took a dramatic turn and I was off onto something totally different. I started exploring the symbolic meaning of owls and their connection to the UFO contact experience, and it took over my life. The owl itself is all over our world's folklore and mythic traditions and even fiction. And when you reduce it down and you try to look at all of the owl folklore and mythology, there comes a point when there's like the key element, the, the one overriding factor is that owls can see into the darkness and owls can fly in the night. Now we live in a world with electric light bulbs and we are no longer separated from the night, but to, to primitive man or even just a couple of hundred years ago the night had a totally different meaning. It was a place of testing, it was a place of danger, and the owls could fly into the darkness. And everyone knew that from the caveman right until today, they knew owls could fly in the dark. And that became a metaphor for flying into the land of the dead, for flying to the land of the ancestors, for flying into the land of the gods, and then returning with a message. So, for instance, the wise owl, the, where we get that comes from is Athena. And Athena, the Greek goddess of wisdom, had a little owl as a companion. That's getting close to 3,000 years ago that mythology arose. Athena is the namesake of Athens, so the, at the core of Greek mythology is an owl. And this owl, even till today, represents wisdom, like a little kid graduating from kindergarten and moving on to first grade. They'll have little owls thumbtacked to the bulletin board. It's normal. So present day, right now, Harry Potter is the most popular series of books in the history of publication. So this is at the core of our present day mythology. And Harry Potter has a pet owl that delivers the mail. It could not be more perfect. The owl delivers the mail. It is a messenger. So at the core of our present mythology is an owl as messenger. I was in the mountains. I saw an owl. It delivered a message. 
that I heard internally, and it says, this has something to do with UFOs. So this ancient mythology, I am convinced, is somehow imbued into what it means to be a person. These are archetypal experiences. These, the owl is an archetype of wisdom and entering the other realm and returning with a message. And that's consistent all across the world's folklore. The owl is also consistent with a lot of death mythology, a metaphor for traveling into another realm, the realm of the dead. That has been the core of my research, the real owls and how they play a role in these UFO contact experiences. This is the simplest version. A fellow named Derek told me this story. This was very early on in my research. He got a hold of me and he told me I was sleeping out in the desert and I was with a friend and we were lying there looking up at the stars together. And then I said, look, there's an owl. And we turned and looked and there was this owl on a tall cactus looming above us. And it's, they got the creeps. They said it gave them the creeps. And this owl watched him for a moment and then flew off. And then seconds later, a giant triangle shaped craft silently flew above their camp. And this fellow, Derek, who told me the story, worked really hard to try to articulate the strangeness of the motion of that flight. He said this craft silently followed the contours of the canyon we were in. And his friend saw it, he saw it. So there's a perfect example. Owls, UFOs, side by side. He was describing what, by all accounts, is a real owl. And now, to make this story even stranger, I asked a few more questions of Derek and what had been going on in his life. And it didn't take him too long to say, you know, all this stuff really pushed me on a different path because he saw another UFO several nights later. And then he said, all of that led up to a spiritual awakening. And that is not uncommon in these studies. People will see a UFO and then they'll say, oh, I had a spiritual awakening or my spirituality changed or my life path changed. So the question arises, why the owl in connection with UFOs? And I am cautiously arguing, because I cannot prove this, I am cautiously arguing that the owl would be a sort of totem of a transformational experience. I've talked to a lot of people who have seen UFOs close up, and they are not the same afterwards. Their definition of reality changed after that close-up sighting. And it is not 100% of the people who see UFOs and also see owls. But it's enough that there's very clearly a pattern. So that's where I'm at. I'm trying to pull on these threads and try to figure out why owls and why are they connected to the UFO contact experience. In the intervening years, I did a lot of research on owls and UFOs, and I put it online, and I had a blog, and a lot of the blog is UFOs and owls. So what happened was if anyone anywhere in the world types in, they get on Google, they type in UFOs, owls, I'm the first thing that comes up, and then I'm about the next 15 things that come up underneath that list. And I am receiving a flood of powerful owl stories. It's about once a day. It ebbs and flows, but it's about one powerful owl story a day that I have been getting for over a decade. And I knew at some point, like, I was going to have to do something with this research. And in a way, I had become the owl guy, and I knew it. It was fascinating to me. Now, I was driving home from a UFO conference in March of 2013. And the UFO conference was in Arizona, and I lived at the time in Idaho. So to drive home, you have to go right through... Utah. And I knew I was going to stop along Highway 20 and sleep. And it was funny because even the morning I got up, I was like, I bet you I sleep at this spot. I had only driven that road once and I had a good feeling that I'd be able to find a good camping spot. So the sun went down. It was a cold, clear night in March. And I got to the spot. It was just exactly as I remembered it. There was a little turnoff. I pulled on the turnoff and there was some little parking spots with old campfires and stuff. It was a perfect spot to sleep out. For one night. And this would have been March 10th, 2013, a Sunday night. And I laid my big sleeping pad down. I had a big winter sleeping bag and a pillow. And I pulled it out of the back of my Subaru and laid it down in this in the dirt. And I looked up at the stars and I, I said, I love this. I love sleeping out. The stars were magnificent. It's a very empty part of southern Utah where I was sleeping. I woke up at one point in the night. And I looked at this sort of gentle, rounded hilltop that was nearby. 
and on top of this hill was a round structure with a ring of lights around it. And I laid there in the sleeping bag and I said, this looks just like a landed flying saucer. And I looked at it and I was like, I, if this is a landed flying saucer, shouldn't I feel something? Shouldn't there be some emotion? Shouldn't there be some jitters? And I stared at this thing and there was nothing, nothing at all. And I said, someone just built a big round house up on top of that hill. And I rolled over and went to sleep. A little while later, at some point in the night, I woke up again and there was a coyote howling near my head. Now, my life has changed so much since I've gone down this avenue of research and stuff. So I am very aware of like the spirit lore and the totem legacy of the coyote. The coyote is a trickster. It plays a very important role in the folklore of the Southwest people. So here I was in Southern Utah. There was a coyote howling away. There was actually two. One was very close. One was a little farther away. I've slept out, I don't know, many thousand, a thousand nights or something. Who knows? Under the stars, I've heard a lot of coyotes. I have never, ever, ever heard one that close and that loud. I could not understand why I didn't see it. It felt like it should have been 10 feet away from me. It felt like I could take a little dog butt biscuit and toss it in the air and it would have landed in the coyote's mouth. And I just laid down and said, wow, that's remarkable. I looked up at the big round structure on the hill again and then went back to sleep. I woke up a third time. And this time there was a juniper bush near my feet. And I sat up and there was a bright light behind the juniper bush. I, I did that thing where you kind of move your head from side to side to like, like can I make out what that is on the other side of the light? It didn't seem like a car headlight. It didn't seem like someone with a flashlight. It didn't seem like a dome light on the interior of a car. I figured, well, I guess someone's doing the same thing I did. They're just pulling off on the side of the road to, to sleep on a long drive. And I rolled over, but before I went to sleep, I looked back up and the round structure was still there on the hill. The next morning I woke early. It was before sunrise. I got in my car and drove off. This is a weird detail. I don't remember if I looked up to see if the round structure was on the hill or not. I may have, but I don't remember looking up. I have since been back to that spot. There is no big round building on top of that hill. And when I got home that afternoon... The first thing I did, probably before I even took my coat off getting in the house, was sat down on my desk, turned on Google Maps, and tried to find that round structure on the hill. There's nothing there. I put up a blog post, and I wrote about, you know, like this weird thing happened where I saw what looked like a flying saucer. It doesn't make any sense. There's nothing on Google Maps. It was over two miles away from where I was lying in the, in the sand, which on a clear night in the desert isn't all that far away. So I published this little blog post giving my experiences and I remember I was standing right next to my desk that afternoon and I had this psychic flash this moment of psychic visual seeing and I saw in my mind's eye a map of southern Utah with a yellow line stretched across the, the map and there were three push pins like you would get on Google Maps or something and I saw this in my mind's eye for a half a second click it was there, click, it was gone. And I was like, okay, what does this mean? And I was standing right next to my computer. I sat in my chair, opened Google Maps, and created a map. I knew exactly what was on the westernmost point of that map. That was the event that happened the night before between Beaver, Utah, and Cedar City, Utah. And I knew it was at the other end, the easternmost spot of the map. And that was an event in 2010. And I was camping with a good friend of mine, and her name was Natasha. And we were driving around the West. We were having a wonderful, beautiful time. We had been to uh, Mesa Verde, which is in southern Colorado. And it's a beautiful Pueblo structure, an ancient Pueblo structure. And we'd spent the morning there. And in the afternoon, we went to the town of Cortez, Colorado to have lunch. But while we were driving there, the brakes on my car were acting funny. We had lunch. I asked the guy at the restaurant if he knew a mechanic, went to this mechanic a few blocks away, and the guy calls us into the office, and he's got his oily rag in his hand. And he looks at me and says, I can't let you leave town or you'll die. And he said, your brakes are at the point of failing. I can't legally allow you to leave the shop. The brakes are that bad. He said, well, uh, we can fix it, but it'll take five days to get the parts. So the shop was actually really great. They helped me get a really cheap rent-a-car. 
And so Natasha and I spent five extra days down there driving around. That night, we camped right near the town of Cortez in a very small town called Dolores, Colorado. And Natasha and I spent the night in the tent. And it was a perfect spot. We were just camped alongside a Forest Service road just outside of Dolores. And we went right to sleep. And then both of us woke up screaming. Both of us woke up in the act of this primal scream. And I have never in my life been as frightened as I was in that moment. I had spent what feels like decades of my life camping outside. And I have never felt that way. If a grizzly bear ripped through the tent and put its jaws around my throat, I would not have been as scared as I was in that moment. She describes it the exact same way. I, I was like, what just happened? What happened? What happened? What happened? And she said, I saw a face. And and I didn't see anything. And And then I remember there was this sort of, it felt like a switch got thrown and we were both back asleep. And at that point, I had this palpable elevator up feeling. And I feel like I could visually see this. I, I initially dismissed this as a dream. I had this elevator up feeling and I just floated up and passed right through the surface of the tent. While I was in the tent, I saw what looked like a round pizza pan floating in the tent with a little circle in it. I, I called it a mandala the morning after. I made some notes in my sketchbook and drew a little picture of this thing inside the tent the next morning. So here's what happened. I I'm suddenly have this elevator up feeling. I'm floating. I go right through the roof of the tent. I'm suddenly in this white realm. I'm not a work ship or anything like that. I'm just like, it's just white. That's all I can say is this totality of whiteness. And as I'm floating, and as I'm in this whiteness, I say, I have to remember this. I have to remember this. I have to remember this. I remember the next thing was Natasha's voice. Natasha's German. She has a German accent. So I heard her with her German accent. And she said, Mike, you're floating. And then whoosh, I was back in the tent. Now, I'm going to be cautious how I say this. I don't think that's exactly what played out. But that is exactly my memory. And the next morning... We got up and and we sat up in the tent and I like, Natasha, what happened last night? What happened? And she said, I have no idea. I saw a face. She said, where did you see the face? And she pointed to the exact same spot where I had seen the floating pizza pan. That's all I can call it. The floating pizza pan in the tent, the mandala. And I got out of the tent and I walked around and I was like, I was looking for the burn mark in the grass where a flying saucer had landed. I didn't find anything. There was nothing there. It was a perfectly calm beautiful morning. The birds were chirping. It was this Rocky Mountain morning. I was astonished. So we drove into town, went to a coffee shop, and I called a friend of mine who'd spent a lot of time down in that part of the country. I said, look, we're stuck here for five days. What do we do? She goes, you go to Canyon de Chez on the Navajo reservation, and you have a sweat lodge experience with this native that lives there. It's a Navajo man. And that's exactly what we did. And we called ahead, and he said, great, I'll fit you in tomorrow. So we went there, and we drove this beautiful drive between Colorado and, and northern Arizona. Canyon de Chez is, is as remarkable a place in the Colorado Plateau as anything. And so we had a tour with a native guide and walked around the bottom of it. You're not allowed to travel on the bottom of the canyon without a, a native guide. It was great. It was so wonderful. And the next morning, we had a a sweat lodge, which was all set up. It was a little uh, sweat lodge. It wasn't very big. It looked like the size of a large tent. It was just a structure with blankets on top and hot rocks would be put in the middle. So there was a fire outside where the rocks were getting hot. There was a few other people at the campground that were doing it too. And there was a fire where they would heat up the rocks. Now, we had been camping and we were kind of grubby and that typical, you know, living out of like a car kind of thing. I took my shirt off and I had a scratch that started at my left shoulder and went down to my belly button. And I have to assume I would have known if I had gotten a scratch like that. And I'm saying that that scratch happened the night of that irrational fear in the tent with Natasha, which was the previous night. I looked at it very closely, and Natasha looked at it very closely, and it was not a scratch at all. It was a, it was a tight little row of tiny blisters, little tiny fluid-filled blisters. When you stepped away, it looked like someone had scratched my chest with a rose thorn or a cat claw, but up close it was fluid filled blisters. Now we have this sweat lodge experience and I'd never been through anything like that. And the entire theme of that experience was to surrender to the power of nature. And I thought it was so 
remarkable. Now, I just told a very long story about one event. It started with a guy saying, you can't leave town or you'll die. And it ended with a mythic shamanic ritual of death and rebirth, the sweat lodge experience. And it was these bookend an event where I had an irrational fear and felt I had gone to a white realm. Now, like I can't separate these these pre- very pragmatic the, the the breaks in the car these very mystical the the sh- the shamanic experience of the sweat lodge I can't separate any of that so I just so these are the two points in the map these are the outlying points in the map the easternmost point and the westernmost point and there was something in the middle there were three and the line was perfectly straight so I thought and I said you know I I think I know where that was I camped out on the Birch Trail Road with Natasha. In 2011, one year after the event with the night in the tent. And she came over from Germany specifically to drive around the West. And, and we camped out on the Burr Trail Road, which is this beautiful spot just east of Boulder, Utah. And we had been driving all day and she was jet lagged and I was tired from driving. And so we we're both lying in the sand in this beautiful spot. And she says, Mike, I can't sleep. What do I do? And I said, just walk around, take a walk. It's a beautiful night. It's a very safe place. Just walk around. So she walks off and I'm lying there on the sand. And as I'm drifting in and out of sleep and she's walked away, there is a great horned owl. There is the unmistakable call of a great horned owl. It is very close to my head. There are some bushes close to my head. This owl was loud. Now I have camped all over the West. I've heard a lot of great horned owls. I have never heard one this close and this loud. I cannot separate this from the coyote that I heard that night on March 10th, 2013. They are parallel in their importance to me. And I'm going to very cautiously say this. I don't know if there was really an owl there. If there was, it was so close. I don't understand how I could not have seen it. Now, I'm lying there listening to this owl. Natasha walks down the road. It's a beautiful road. It connects like two of the smallest towns imaginable, so there's no traffic at all on it at night. And she said it was so beautiful and so magical that it felt like I was sparkling. She said that it felt like I was sparkling. And she's walking along, and she looks off in the sagebrush, and there's this, she said it was like the size of a beach ball, this floating orb of light. And her first thought was, someone's out in the bushes with a flashlight. And she realized, no, it's a floating ball of light. It's just floating around and it starts to come towards her and then it like explodes and disappears. And now she's scared. She runs back. She wakes me up and she says, Mike, we got to leave. And I'm like, what, what, what? She explains, I just saw this thing and just saw this weird light and let's get out of here. And it's like, okay. So we got in the car and drove away. Now, when, when you take those three points in the map and stretch them out, I had created a map. I pinpointed exactly where I was the night of March 10th. I pinpointed exactly where I was camping outside of Dolores. And when you stretch that that line, basically you pull it taut, a straight line. And I zoomed in on the map of where we slept. It passes directly over where my sleeping pad was while I was listening to an owl. And Natasha was seeing a, a UFO, a floating ball of light, an unidentified flying object. It was at that moment that all my doubts about this UFO stuff evaporated. I fully recognized this was real. This really happened. I can no longer live with the doubt that had been plaguing me. There's a million weird synchronicities and strange little things that are connected with this story. I'll just tell you one of them. So three events on a map, three dots on a map. Two of them involved Natasha, where she saw the floating orb and where we had the night of terror in the tent. The other event, I was alone. That happened on March 10th. That is Natasha's birthday. So the story is so tangled up with these weird, strange synchronicities that it left me helpless in the face of its power. And I have lived my life since that point with a 
completely different understanding of reality. So after all this, I've written three books on owls and UFOs. You stack those three books up, it's a thousand pages. Like no one in the whole world needs to write another word about owls and UFOs. If I have squeezed the dish rag dry of anything that has to do with owls and UFOs, and I am still at a loss to what it truly means. I, I can dance around the edges and say what it might mean, and I can speculate on what it f could be, but I can certainly say what it feels like to me. In some traditions, if you want to become a shaman, it is well understood in these cultures. And this is, I, and I've done a lot of research on this, and I've talked to a lot of people who have become shamans and worked with shamans and gone through a shamanic apprenticeship. These people see owls during their apprenticeship. This is well understood in all kinds of cultures all over the world. I had one person tell me, she was actually channeling. This is, I mean, believe me, I went down every avenue. I talked to a woman who claimed to channel owls, the spirit of an owl. And I said to her like, okay, if you can talk to owls, you tell me what's the meaning of the owls. And then all of a sudden she started talking very haltingly she said, owls are here to announce initiation. She said, owls are an archetype. They are a symbol. We see things as symbols. We experience the most powerful events symbolically. And the owl is an archetypal symbol that shows up at the point of contact to announce initiation. And I had been struggling with the research at that point. When she said that, everything in my research clicked together. Like it was like, oh, I had all these puzzle pieces on the table that I couldn't figure out how they went together. It felt like the entire puzzle just went click and I could see the big picture. Now me feeling that's what it is doesn't make it true, but I can say that owls are here to announce initiation and they are performing an archetypal role. Now, you could go sit in some philosophy lecture at a high-end college and struggle over what that might mean. I can say from my own direct experience, owls are playing a role in my life, and I have talked to many thousands of people who have the same story. You can see an owl, and then you're obviously seeing a bird with big eyes sitting on a branch or flying through the forest. What you are tapping into is the archetypal resonance of something much richer and much more ancient. And I would argue that people all throughout human history have had powerful experiences with owls. Now, it doesn't have to have UFOs involved. They can People have powerful experiences around death, around meditation, and also UFOs. So in a way, would the owls then be synonyms for UFOs, for death? for meditation, for shamanic initiation. I would argue that the mythologies of the owl arose out of real life human experiences. There would have been a day if you were a young native in a village off in South Dakota, turned the clock back 600 years, and you had a powerful experience with an owl, you could just walk to the teepee at the edge of the village and talk to the shaman and say, Here's what happened. I was walking down the path and an owl flew past me and I felt that it communicated with me. That shaman would be remarkably well positioned to help the person come to terms with what that owl meant. The traditions all over the world are different, but I would argue that the message that the shaman would give would be different. We don't live in that world anymore. What's happening now is people are having powerful experiences with owls and UFOs, and they are finding me. They are contacting me. And I am not a shaman, but what I have found is that I can bring a tremendous amount of solace to these people by listening to them, by talking to them, by saying, okay, your story is parallel to another person's story. And because of that, you are not alone. You have had what I would call a human experience that we have had all throughout the history of, of mankind.
So I fully recognize that I am way out on the outer edge of an already bizarre subject, right? So UFOs dismissed. People don't want to dirty their hands with a subject like UFOs. I'm in this pool of researchers and people who've had experiences. And, and this owl stuff, let me tell you, in that pool, I am dismissed. Like, I am the crazy one. Because these stories, on some level, are so outlandish. I've often said that I am a credible person telling an incredible story. I have been very cautious not to exaggerate. I've been very cautious not to um, tell people's stories out of context. And, I, and people have given me permission to share their stories. I cannot convince anyone. All I can do is speak my truth and say what I've found in my research. I fully recognize this stuff is on the outer bounds of what may or may not be real. I, I also say that it would be totally easy to just dismiss it. And as an outsider, someone, not me, could dismiss this. There's a term in this research where you, you have like the one story or the one experience and you say, I no longer have the luxury of denial. Like I knew, I knew in my heart, I knew in my bones, I knew in my, the fiber of my being, this really happened. There's very little I can say to convince someone. All I can say is, I've done my very best not to exaggerate. I looked back over the 1,000 pages of published material I have out about owls and UFOs. There is so much that ties into me sleeping out under the stars. And this is a magical ritual. For me, sleeping out under the stars is a form of abandonment. And I don't know any other way to say it. I am completely giving myself over to the heavens above and the ground below. And I will often lie down and say, universe, I am open and receptive to whatever you have to offer. Sometimes I'll get a powerful dream. Sometimes I will get a powerful synchronicity. Sometimes I'll hear an owl. Sometimes nothing at all will happen. But the act of lying under the stars, for me, is an act of spiritual renewal. I'm doing it on purpose because I am trying to tap into both a deeper part of the universe and a deeper part of myself. After everything I've been through and all the obsessive writing and all the archivings of the stories and the accounts, I no longer see reality in the same way. You know, people have asked me, after all of this, how have you changed? What insights have you have you arrived at? And I remember the first time I was asked that, I had to think for a moment, and I said, I now live in a magical universe. That's correct. I live in a magical universe. I'm pretty bad. Like, every little squirrel that, like, runs across the path on, when I'm on a hike, I'm like, does this mean something? Is this a totem? Is this a symbol? Well, a lot of times it's not. But I am predisposed to see reality as something much richer and much more complex and much more playful and much more mysterious than what I was taught in junior high school physics class. believer now? Well, either way, let us know by dropping us a review over on Apple Podcasts. It's really appreciated. Learn more about the magical world of messenger owls and UFOs in Mike's books, The Messengers and Stories from the Messengers. Mike's also a brilliant illustrator and has written and illustrated a series of books on ultralight backpacking. You can find these books and all his other work on his website, mikecleland.com. And one other thing for Mike, Make sure to check out his podcast, The Unseen with Mike Cleland, which you can find by going over to unknowncountry.com. And as always, we'll leave links to all of these places in our show notes. Make sure to give us a follow on our Instagram page, at Out and Back Podcast. And finally, don't forget, you can maybe go find owls and UFOs for yourself. But before you head out into the wilderness to do that, 
make sure you snag yourself a Gaia GPS premium membership at a 20% discount by going to GaiaGPS.com slash podcast. Until next time, if nothing else, may the trails sparkle a little brighter. Oh,